Well, it's hard for me to get enough of debates between atheists and believers, and judging by responses from our listeners, it seems that you agree. And this morning, we're following up on a Sunday New York Times discussion of whether atheism is rational. With me are frequent air talk guest and atheist Michael Shermer. He's founder of the Skeptic Society, publisher of Skeptic Magazine, and columnist for Scientific American. And our guest of faith is Professor William Lane Craig of Talbot Theological Seminary in La Mirada. Talbot's affiliated with Biola University, and uh, uh, William Lane Craig is professor of philosophy. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us. I appreciate it. Uh, Atheists argue believing in God is illogical. Michael Shermer, what makes atheism logical? (laughs) Well, we have to remember first, atheism is is not a whole world view. It's just a position statement on whether there's a God or not. And atheists simply say, uh, we have no belief in God. There's no evidence for God. And in science, the default position is what's called the null hypothesis. That is, your claim is not true until you provide evidence to the contrary. That is, we remain skeptical until there's some evidence for it, whether it's Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or or psychic powers or or God. And so the God question then can be put into the empirical uh, uh, category of, is it true or not? Let's see the evidence you have for it. What's the empirical evidence? Until then, the reasonable, rational position is is simply the skeptical position, like like it would be with any claim. So to that extent, um, it's rational, and that that's simply the way science works. Beyond that, it's you know we, we you know, what we believe in uh, has nothing to do with atheism because athe- atheism doesn't posit things like uh, rights and and civil liberties and things like that that has nothing to do with 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 religion or whether there's a god or not. So to that extent, it's not a full on belief system. It's simply a statement, a rational statement about the god question. But that, I mean, on the god question, doesn't atheism posit that there is no god? That that is definitive. Uh, well, so there's there's the weak atheist position, which is just taking it literally as as without belief in God, without further um, elaboration. The strong atheists go further and say there's evidence that there is no God. Um, and so it just depends on what the particular claim is being made as to, to where I stand on that. For the most part, I'm, I'd say, a weak atheist. that I just say, I don't believe in God, and, and that's that. But I think a case can be made that there there is positive evidence showing that the God concept and religions built around it uh, are socially constructed, geographically determined. For example, if you're born in India, you're not very likely to be an evangelical Christian, uh, whereas if you're born in America, you have a much uh, higher probability of being an evangelical Christian. But there's no, no such thing like that in physics. There's not Indian physics and Chinese physics and North American physics. There's just one universal physics, and that's the difference between God and religion and science, and to that extent, um, I think we can make a case that there's positive evidence in favor of that there probably isn't a God. It's probably socially constructed, a product of the human mind. Uh, Joining us also, uh, Professor Craig, I mean, but there is almost universality of belief in God or some God-like entity. For you, is, is, is that more than just some artifact of our neurology? I think it's important to understand that there are three distinct positions that one can take take with regard to the God question. You can affirm that God exists, then you're a theist. You can affirm God does not exist, then you're an atheist. Or you can say, I simply lack any belief about this one way or the other, and then you're an agnostic. And what Mr. Shermer has described is really agnosticism, not atheism. Atheism is the claim that God does not exist. But in our day and age, atheists are finding it increasingly difficult to give compelling arguments for that. And so they adopt the weaker position, which is really agnosticism, which says, I just lack a belief in God. But that is not a truth claim. That's just a description of a person's psychological state. My my cat Angel lacks belief in God, but you wouldn't call him an atheist because uh, of that. So uh, I think the question is, where does the evidence point? To theism or to atheism? Or is it so unclear that we simply uh, withhold belief in our agnostics? 
Love to hear from listeners on this. You can weigh in on whether you think atheism is rational. Is is it rational if if you're someone who isn't a believer, where you see religious belief, religious faith as irrational? 866-893-KPCC, 866-893-5722, or the AirTalk page, kpcc.org. The question is, is being an atheist, a strictly logical conclusion if there's an absence of logic in in religious belief. Uh, I mean, Professor Craig, uh, would you make the argument that there is a, a logical, a rational argument for faith? Yes, I would. And I don't think either Michael Shermer or myself are claiming that there are knockdown arguments either way, that it's irrational to be a theist or irrational to be an atheist. I think it's a matter of probability. Which way does the preponderance of the evidence point? And we would just disagree on which side of the scale the evidence weighs most heavily. I think that there are good reasons to believe that God exists. I think that the God hypothesis has a very broad explanatory power across the range of human experience. And by contrast, there really aren't very many good arguments against God's existence, that there is no such being as God. So I think on balance, the evidence supports the theistic claim. Is is most, though, of the argument that we have for the existence of God uh, a kind of de facto God in the gap, that as science explains mm. more than God is what we call our, our ignorance, our lack of knowledge, and oh. we, that God explains it? And is that essentially what God in the world has become? Yeah, I wouldn't agree with that. Here's the way I would put it. I think that scientific evidence can support a premise in a philosophical argument for a conclusion having theological significance. For example, take the cosmological argument for God's existence. Uh, Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Now, the second premise of that argument, the universe began to exist, is a religiously neutral statement that can be found in almost any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. It is certainly capable of scientific confirmation or disconfirmation by the evidence. And so what I would argue is not that you argue for a God to plug the gaps in scientific knowledge. Rather, you can marshal scientific evidence in support of a neutral premise in a philosophical argument that leads to a conclusion that has theological significance. We're talking with Dallas School of Theology professor of philosophy, William Lane Craig. Also with us, Michael Shermer of Skeptic Magazine, a Skeptic Society, and columnist for Scientific American. We're at 866-893-KPCC or the AirTalk page, kpcc.org. John in Van Nuys, welcome. Thank you. I am an atheist, and I think it makes perfect sense. It's the most logical position to take. I had a question for both speakers, and I'll take my answer off the air. Is uh, Can you comment on the growth of atheism and, and agnosticism in the United States? I've heard reports, I've read reports, it's the fastest growing uh, uh, philosophy in the U.S. among any religion right now is actually atheism, including agnosticism and atheism. Is that true or not? Thank Michael you. Shermer? Yeah, that's true. Uh, The fastest growing uh, religious cohort or non-religious cohort are the nuns, the people that tick the box for no religious affiliation at all, at 20%. That's one out of five. Now, they aren't necessarily atheists. They just have no religious affiliation, which is a little bit different. But the people that uh, affirm that they don't believe in God at all is is nudged up slightly in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And uh, that's just in America, uber religious America. In Europe, the numbers are well into the two digits of you know fifty percent, sixty percent of people don't believe in God in Northern European countries. But that's a sociological, political question having to do with the role of religion. Um, getting back to what Dr. Craig was saying, in terms of you know you have to fit into one of these these categories based on how they're defined, atheist, agnosticism, and so on. I think a fourth category is one I hinted at that 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 religion and the God concept itself is is constructed by humans, and it's pretty clear from the anthropological and 
psychological study of religion, that that is the case, as I said, depending on where you were born, what century you were born in, and so on, that's going to pretty much determine what God you happen to believe in and what set of arguments you then construct to believe in that God, and that will always change. Science, on the other hand, is, is more universal. And I'm an empiricist, so we can make cosmological arguments, and those have all been countered. The argument that Dr. Craig just made, the cosmological argument, has been counter-argued by David Hume and all the way up to modern physicists, so you can go back and forth on that. But but for an empiricist like me, it's like, well, where's the evidence? I mean, come on, where's like the intervention of the deity in our lives, the, the healing of people that were sick, the, the growing of a limb of an amputee, some, something so I can where see d- and measure. Where does, the, where does the almost universal belief, albeit in different forms, where does that belief come from? Is it neurological artifact or something more than that, Michael? Oh, well, in the believing brain, I, I, I argue that it's it's based on this concept of agenticity, that we we, te- we have a tendency to find meaningful patterns in the world and then infuse those patterns with agency, hidden, invisible forces at work, whether it's animism that the trees and the wind and lightning and the clouds are all animated with a life force of some kind, to polytheism, lots and lots of different gods, to monotheism, there's a single god pulling the strings behind the scenes. Our brains just do that. There's a lot of cognitive psych evidence showing how... Uh, people infuse um, uh, in, in sort of hidden invisible forces at work, agency, e- e- essence to it, like organ uh, transplant recipients feel like there's some essence of the person that came with the organ, with with the organ into them now. that That's a kind of a agency at work, hidden forces, pulling the strings, conspiracies, things like that. Our brains just go that way. And then culture builds on that. Uh, you know, religion is very much tied into political control over people and so on, and then, then we're into anthropology and, and politics. So I think it's a it's slightly more complicated than just saying it's a, it's a, a, a tweak of the brain. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. But I think the argument could be made that all of it is, is constructed by people and and, and not vice versa, not God making us. Uh, Professor Craig, how how do you respond to that? This combination of of culture and 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 simply the way our brains work is what creates the concept of God. Well, I think this is almost a textbook example of what philosophers call the genetic fallacy, which is trying to invalidate a belief by showing how that belief originated. Uh, for example, someone could say the only reason you believe in liberal democratic government is because you were raised in the United States. Does that therefore prove that your belief in democracy is wrong? Uh, If you were born in ancient Greece, you might have believed that the sun goes around the earth. Uh, And the fact that you live in the modern day, you believe the opposite. Does that mean those beliefs are therefore uh, simply human constructs, that there is no truth? Obviously not. You can't invalidate the truth of a belief by explaining the process whereby a person came to hold that belief. So what the atheist needs to do is to give us some argument that there is no referent or a reality that corresponds to the concept of God, not just explain how the concept of God may have originated. And I think the theist can give quite good arguments to show that in fact there is an objective referent for those concepts, that there really is a creator and designer of the universe. Well, that may be, <laughs> uh, but but short of, of uh, empirical evidence for that, which which clearly we don't have, because if we did, we wouldn't be having the debate. It would be, there he is, there's God. Uh, the, the question is, well, then how come so many people believe? And then I offer, I mean, this is what I do. I'm a social scientist, so I study these things. It's not a genetic fallacy. Somebody asks, how come there's so many people believe in God? Here's an answer. Now, there may be a God, yes, okay, so where's the evidence? Not just philosophical arguments that if A is true, then B is true, then C is true, and D, I've got God and the whole thing. No. How about some empirical evidence, a measurable, testable? Here it is in the laboratory. I can see it, measure it. Everybody can, you know, like a laboratory experiment. All scientists from anywhere in the world can look at the data and go, yep, that's, that's right. What if God, by definition, though, is beyond empirical measurement? Well, then it's, then, okay, then it's beyond the realm of science. Uh, in fact, it's beyond the realm of all human knowledge. We can't know it. 
it would just be, I think it's true, and you say, I think it's not true, and it's the end of the conversation. And I don't think even Dr. Craig would be satisfied with that, because it doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere. It just sort of stops the conversation. I mean, if, if it's true that, that God is out there in, the, in our world somewhere, we should be able to measure him somehow. But what would be the difference between a super-advanced extraterrestrial intelligence who's capable of genetic engineering life, say, and a God who could do that, that's invisible? <laughs> so, well, now, God isn't in the universe on the Christian or traditional conception of God. He's a being that transcends the universe. And that's why I think the arguments for the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, are so powerful, they can't be explained by any kind of extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe, because what's at issue here is the creation design of the very arena or the, the structure of the universe itself. And the evidence that I would appeal, appeal to, as you know, Michael, would be empirical evidence to support those key premises in these arguments leading to the conclusion that therefore there is a transcendent personal creator or there is a uh, designer of the universe or there is a source of absolute moral goodness. Uh, I'm quite willing to go to the mat with uh, atheists uh, arguing empirically for those key premises in these theistic arguments, and have done so repeatedly. But, but why not go with multiple on gods? university right. campuses across the country. Yeah. Why not go with multiple gods, then? There was mul more than one creator. There was six creators, and it was a committee. Yeah. I mean, well, once you I go think down Occam's that road, razor you with... would tell us that you don't posit causes beyond necessity. You only posit such causes as are necessary to explain the effect. And so I think for simplicity's sake, one creator of the universe suffices. You don't need to postulate more. That would let, be an unnecessarily complicated hypothesis. Well, let me uh, bring Jason in Beverly Hills into our conversation. <laughs> Jason, good to have you with us. Jason, Hi, uh, uh, I just wanted to pose a question to both debaters, um, because I, I sort of had this growing up in uh, Florida, and then now I live in Beverly Hills, California, and I've sort of changed over my whole thinking, and it's enlightened me in many areas of my life, not just religion. And that question is, what would it take uh, to change your mind on either side? Because even though it kind of hurts to be wrong, uh, sometimes whenever I'm presented with certain things and it enlightens me and I change my mind, yeah. I eventually feel a lot better with that. Great question. Michael Shermer, what would convince you there's a God? A large cash deposit in a Swiss bank account with my name on it. One Seriously. million dollars is what I would take. <laughs> You're going cheap on this. No, sir. What, what would it take? Well, I, I do think it would be something, it would have to be something like uh, some empirical evidence that, that, that was unmistakable, that could not be explained by some natural forces. And here we get into the problem of, uh, well, then what would a supernatural force look like if we're only able to measure natural forces? And the moment God is a natural force, then he's no longer, it is no longer God. It's just another part of the natural world. So in principle, the kind of God that Dr. Craig believes in, that most Christians believe in, the Yahweh, the, the, the monotheistic God of Abraham, I don't, I don't think could be tested in some scientific way. I don't think it's possible, because they're claiming it's, uh, this God is supernatural, outside of space and time. Right. Therefore, there is no... We're off the page of science right there. Professor Craig, what would convince you there's no God? I think it's important to distinguish in this question between what would convince me and what should convince me. The first question, what would convince you to change your mind, is a question about my personal psychology, to which I don't know the answer. Uh, for all I know, uh, it, what might make me change my mind would be maybe the horrible death of my wife by cancer or, or something of that sort. That's a question of personal psychology and isn't really philosophically interesting. The important question is the question, what should make me change my mind? And I would say there, if you were to defeat all of the arguments for God's existence that I've defended in my public works and published debates, and if you were to give some sort of good argument for atheism, then I should change my mind. I do think the problem of evil is, is a substantial one for theists. That good thing, the bad things happen to good people, and so on. if God is all powerful and all knowing and all good, why do these things happen? I don't. Wasn't mean... there a whole Christian theology? I don't know about other faiths, but there's a whole Christian theology yep. built around an explanation for evil in the world. Yep. 
It's a, and they haven't answered it. That's why it's still. That's why it's a big body of literature, and, and people keep debating it. Gentlemen, I, I know you're both very busy, and unfortunately, we have to bring our conversation to a close. But I want to thank you so much for being with us. Just a fascinating conversation. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you, and hi to you, Michael. I haven't seen in some time, but good to be on with you. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Michael Shermer of Skeptics, also a philosophy professor from Talbot School of Theology at Biola University, William Lane Craig. Please share. Your your comments. They're terrific listener calls we weren't able to accommodate. Would you please take those comments, put them on the AirTalk page right now or in the coming minutes at kpcc.org.